We're only ever likely to go to Japan once in our lives. And so it's really important to get it right. Now, while I didn't get everything 100% spot on on my trip, I now know what future cruisers do need to know to avoid my mistakes, work around any downsides, and ensure that they have the very best time. Now, I actually found the biggest and first challenge is actually making sure that you get to see the right sites and truly experience the unique culture. I saw many of my fellow travelers come away not really seeing the best of either. By the way, if you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan, and enjoy incredible cruise vacations, including those to Japan. You really must ensure that your cruise is long enough and jam-packed with Japanese ports. Now, I recommend, if you can, at least a 10-day cruise like I did on Regent Explorer, which had seven Japanese ports plus the embarkation port of Tokyo. Now, this is really important because you will lose at least one day of your cruise exploring Japan because cruisers out of Japan must call on a foreign port, which is often Busan in South Korea. Now, the next essential thing, therefore, before going is plan what you're actually going to see in the ports to avoid making a mistake that I saw quite a few people did on my cruise who were moaning by the end that they were seeing very repetitive things, very repetitive excursions, and they were just basically going to see shrine after shrine after shrine. Now, through my experiences, I think there are five key experiences and sites that I really think you should aim to be seeing when you're out in port. And please make sure that you plan a really good mix of them. You should, of course, explore World War II and the atomic bombs dropped on Japan by the USA. They affect two ports on many cruises, which is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, both have peace memorial parks. Hiroshima is dominated by the iconic atomic peace dome and Nagasaki by the statue of a man pointing to the sky. And then they also have museums. I found the Hiroshima Museum a little bit more challenging with its real focus on the injuries and the deaths. Nagasaki Museum is a little bit more factual, a little bit less kind of emotive. While you should, of course, visit shrines and temples, every port has them. So what I recommend you do is make sure that you focus on really iconic or very impressive ones. So for example, those in Kyoto are a must, even though it's a one and a half hour trip from Kobe or Osaka where your ship will dock. The famous Golden Pavilion covered in gold leaf is here, as is the Sanjus Ajengo Buddhist Temple. It has 1,001 statues of Kanan, the Goddess of Mercy, an absolute must. If you're going to Shimuzu, Go to the uh, Kuzan Toshagu Shrine. This requires a cable car ride on the Neondara ropeway. Before the cable car, you'd have had to climb up a thousand stone steps to get there. So as you can see, these kind of big, impressive ones. So for example, another must is the Sensoji Temple in Tokyo, which has the iconic red lantern that you'll instantly recognize from the many publicity shots of the city. Also, by the way, in the city is the Meiji Shrine, which is dedicated to the emperor seen as the father of modern Japan. It's located in an incredible forest of 120,000 trees. Now, I went on many other excursions which have shrines, but I now know that it's really important to check if the ones on the tour or in the port you're in are really significant and important because they are all just kind of similar otherwise. I also recommend you include castles in that mix of things that you make sure you see. Again, like with shrines, some are better than others. In Osaka, for example, I absolutely love Osaka Castle, vast grounds, massive walls and a moat, and the impressive castle building can actually be climbed. In Kochi, the castle is truly, absolutely truly remarkable and is one of the remaining absolute original ones. It was built in the in the 17th century. There's an amazing view if you climb up to the top. If you're going to Kyoto, try and visit to the Nijojo Castle, also in the big, beautiful, sprawling grounds. It was built in the 1600s. You can tour the castle, which has these uh, plank floors that chirp when walked on to warn if there are intruders. Now, another thing I would say is if a place on your itinerary is billed as having a castle, I also learned to check that the castle is actually still there. So for example, I went to Obi Castle, and once I was there, I discovered there's no castle. It had been destroyed. There was just a museum there. So a bit of a watch out. The fourth essential thing to include in that mix are Japanese gardens. And there are some incredible ones that I discovered. So again, check if these are really important ones. Let me give you some examples. In Tokyo, they have the Hamara Yakud Gardens in the center of town, surrounded by skyscrapers. Originally built for a feudal lord's Tokyo home, still has some of the tea houses in there. In Hiroshima, I love the Shukuyin Japanese gardens, created 400 years ago, 
and meticulously rebuilt after the atomic bomb. In Nagasaki, I found the Glover Garden just above the cruise port. Fascinating. It showcases Western style houses that were key to Japanese history, including Thomas B. Glover, a Scottish man who contributed to Japanese kind of modernization and industrialization. I also recommend you try and build in some visits in your mix of things that go to kind of iconic landscapes especially because, as I'll discuss later, there is an issue with the ports and towns that you will be visiting on your cruise. So for example, if you're in Shimuzu, go to the uh, Miho no Matsubara Pine Forest and Beach. Now this is the spot where that picture postcard shot of Mount Fuji is taken. Now the day I went there, it was covered in clouds, but I did actually get to see Mount Fuji from the port later. I also loved visiting the Rio Gado Caves in Kochi, stalagmite caves, 800 steps in and out of it, fascinating. Also at Aoshima Island, as well as an important shrine, is the very unusual Devil's Washboard where waves have created famous grid formations in the sandstone. So check your ports to see if there are some very important incredible landscapes being called out or musty kind of natural sites. Now those are the things you should see, but I've also discovered a couple of key watchouts that you should factor in when planning all this sightseeing. First, all of these places are on everybody's wish list, both land and cruise visitors. And I actually found them to be really crowded, especially because cruise excursions tend to visit them at really busy times. Also, the peak times and when most cruises operate are spring, which is going to march to April to try and catch the April cherry blossom, and then autumn, which is September to November. So you also will be there, bear in mind, when Japan is at its busiest. The second watch out is I discovered that much of what that we actually get to see is not authentic because many sites or buildings were destroyed or badly damaged either during the Second World War or uh, many of the original buildings which were wood had been destroyed over the sort of centuries and years by fires. So even places like the ancient looking Tokyo Sensoji Temple that I mentioned earlier was actually recreated post-war. So much of what you actually go and see is not all original, especially because things that are close to the port, many of those cities were actually naval or military bases or had heavy industrial factories and were heavily bombed during the war. The third watch out is if you have limited mobility, check the excursion descriptions really carefully because it's often a lot of walking, steep steps, strict rules around where the tour buses can park. So it's often a distance from the sites. And I did actually see a number of people on my tours struggling at times. They hadn't checked the details and actually giving up because it was just a bit too strenuous. Now the fourth watch out is the guides I found on the tours will at best be okay. They're not brilliant. Now I discovered through talking to the cruise line destination services that actually being a tour guide in Japan is not seen as a really prestigious job. So a lot of guides do it as a kind of a second job, perhaps on retirement. And so versus some other regions I've been in, which require a lot of training, the guides I found were just okay. So bear that in mind. The fifth watch out is because most cruises start and end in Tokyo, please, please, please plan a pre or post day to see everything there because what's in Tokyo you just can't see in one day. I, for example, had a three night pre stay included in my cruise and that was hectic. An unexpected challenge I encountered on my trip was it took a lot of effort to actually experience and get immersed into the culture. So be ready for that. I found going on a cruise to Japan, it was really easy to get stuck in a bubble. The tours and the sites, of course, they cater very much to tourists and they often are not within or close to local communities, stores, restaurants. And this was actually kind of magnified because many of the cruise ports are industrial working ports. They're not within the city center with the exception of a couple like say Nagasaki. So you couldn't just kind of stroll into local areas, uh, you know, beyond perhaps uh, a mall that was by some of the ports. Also on the cruise, of course, uh, you get served the usual cuisine that they serve. Uh, you know, so you need to make an effort to go and try local restaurants. I think that's really key. So something I encourage you to check when planning, as it was also a huge miss on my cruise, was there was a lack of Japanese history, culture enrichment, and port talks. We had a, a, a speaker on board, but they were talking about volcanoes, earthquakes, geological things not immersing me into the story, the history, the culture of Japan. You know, I found I was really craving more of that context to better appreciate what I was seeing. So guys will talk about the, the Edo period, the samurai, why and how Japan spent 250 years in isolation from the West, why the capital was changed several times, most recently from Kyoto to Tokyo, what happened to the 
World War II. And you need to understand all that to make the experience, the places and the sites all make much more sense. So I recommend at least before going, buy a really good guidebook and read up. I really wish I'd done more of that, especially because of the tour guide situation I mentioned. Saying all that, there is another thing I would actually do differently now that I know about it. And this is that self-touring is way easier than I had imagined. Most ports had incredible visitor information booths with many people manning them, loads of amazing books, maps and guides on what to see and how to get there. Most ports had shuttle buses laid on to get to the close by places. And there were also then taxis which would be able to take you further afield too. Often at the shuttle bus stops on the other side were even more people there ready to kind of assist and help out. I also found the Japanese were really helpful to tourists and they weren't just kind of point you in the direction. They often to kind of take you there. Uh, for example, when I was off exploring in Kumamoto, uh, there was this little elderly lady. She stopped what she was doing and she insisted on taking and showing a couple all the places she need, they needed to go within the castle and the shrine area. She didn't just sort of explain it and send them off. There are also, by the way, police boxes around in Tokyo and other towns where they will speak English and can help too. I found in all the tourist areas, signs are in both English and Japanese, and especially in tourist areas, there's a lot of English speakers. Most of all, the ports and the port towns were really very, very welcoming of tourists, and they actually went out of their way to make sure it was easy to self-tour. As an aside, they are so welcoming that most ports would also lay on bands, school choirs, school marching troops that would perform to say goodbye to the ship as we sailed away every evening. I loved self-touring because it was also a chance to experience Japan in a much more immersive way. The local restaurants, for example, they all have pictures of food on the menus and they have those kind of plastic replicas in the window. So I found it really easy to kind of point and kind of mime to order a meal. There are drink vending machines all over, which are actually really easy to use. I also loved getting a chance to go and visit kind of crazy shops and retail concepts that the Japanese seem to love. You know, for example, some stocking toys in capsules and big vending machines, and playing in the bright, gaudy, massive game arcades. These are really, really important things to experience, I think. By the way, I found it less expensive than I expected in port, partly because of the favorable exchange rate, and it was kind of London kind of prices once I converted. So self-touring did not feel that costly, and I found using cards was really easy versus cash. I only converted 200 US dollars into yen at the start of my trip, and I didn't even use all of that because I used cards mostly. I will say though that Tokyo hotels were crazy costly to stay in. Trying things that are out of that cruise tour bubble is I think a real must. And as I said, way, way easier to do than I expected. However, there are a couple of important considerations that you do need to factor in as I discovered and self-explored. I found that culturally, there are some really key differences that I think we as visitors need to respect really, really well. I found Japan to be very rules-based and respectful of others. I saw signs all over with rule after rule after rule, and the Japanese expect us to follow them. I did feel there are actually many in and around ports, which I suspect are targeted, particularly at us and our kind of Western behaviors. You know, for example, it's considered inappropriate to kind of speak loudly in public places, to be on phone calls on the metro or public transport, to listen to music where, you know, noise leaks from earphones, do FaceTime calls or watch videos without earphones is an absolute no-no. Even in the Japan Airlines lounge when I was heading home, phone calls were not permitted other than in very specific booths for making calls. There's a real expectation to be polite and very, very respectful. Never, for example, drop litter. People are likely to kind of tap you on the shoulder if they see litter. This happened to me because they assumed I was the only Westerner around, so I must have discarded a bit of litter that was on the floor. I also found that tipping is not a big thing in Japan. I found that if you leave money in a restaurant, they kind of hand it back, uh, assuming that I was leaving it by mistake. Although tour guides, of course, <laughs> they're getting more used to being tipped. I think it is a bit disappointing that Japan seems to though be sort of becoming more and more westernized. I saw loads of Western chains, you know, Starbucks, which I do like, McDonald's, Burger King, loads of 7-Elevens. But certainly from a culture perspective, I found the Japanese very respectful, polite, tidy, and very considerate of other people. So bear that in mind as you start interacting and touring. 
Japan should be on your cruise bucket list. To find out what other places I think should be on that list too, join me in this video where I start with two that most people have on their list that I think should not be there. See you over there.